Welcome to three o'clock talk at it's my accent talk at DefCon. It's gonna be Gabriel Ryan talking about owning land. Let's give him a big DefCon welcome. Come on, I can't hear you. Louder. Thanks. You guys awake yet? Fair enough. All right. Um, got 45 minutes, so like the first like 10 minutes of this is gonna be really fast. Um, I wonder if I can back up from this thing. Can you guys still hear me if I do this? No. no? Okay. All right, so um, I work for a company called Digital Silence. We're a pen testing firm in Denver. Um, I talk more, but I'm gonna skip that. So um, my name is Gabriel Ryan, also known in some circles as Solstice. I'm a co-founder, senior, senior security assessment manager at Digital Silence. Uh, used to work for a company called Gotham Digital Science. Before that, I worked for a DoD contractor in Virginia uh, called OG Systems. Which between the two of those companies, it's pretty much the best two names in security ever. Like OG Systems, that's fucking awesome. Um, also. Uh, about me, um, I'm a red teamer, researcher, uh, new dad, interestingly enough, um, hence the dark circles under my eyes. <laughs> uh, my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn handle is kind of interesting, it's MS08067. <laughs> Got some chuckles out of you. <laughs> so, um, this is a talk about uh, bypassing a particular port security technology. So before we get started, we kind of have to go over some introductory information about 802.1x. Um, 802.1x is an authentication protocol that's designed to provide rudimentary authentication to um, local area networks and also wireless local area networks. Um, the protocol defines an exchange between three parties. The supplicant, which is the client device that you're going to try to connect to the network. Uh, the authenticator, which is the network device that the device is, that the supplicant is connecting to and providing access to the LAN. And the authentication server, which is a host running deeper inside the network um, and it's usually running some kind of like AAA software like Radius that actually performs the actual validation. Um, so you can think of the authenticator, you know, the authenticator is going to be like your switch, right, that the device is connecting to. And you can think of it as a gatekeeper, like a security guard. The supplicant's going to connect to it and provide the authenticator with uh, some credentials. And the, the authenticator doesn't really know what to do with these credentials, so it just forwards them off the authentic to the authentication server, which then validates the credentials and then either sends a message back to the authenticator and tells it to either allow this device to access the network or not to. Um, 802.1x is typically a four step process, uh, beginning with initialization, uh, initiation, uh, then we go to EAP negotiation and authentication. We'll talk more about that in a second. So, uh, when we connect to a switch port that is protected by 802.1x, it's going to have one of two, it's going to be in one of two, two states. It's going to be authorized, and when it's in the authorized um, state, traffic is going to be completely unrestricted, um, at least by 802.1x, and it's, when it's in the unauthorized state, traffic is restricted to only 802.1x traffic. Um, we mentioned the first step of the pro of the editor x authentication process is on initialization, and you know what this means is that the supplicant is going to connect to the switch port, uh, the device is going to hit the switch port, and it's going to start out disabled. Uh, the authenticator is going to detect this new connection, enable the switch port, but the switch port is going to start out in an unauthorized state because uh, we haven't authenticated yet. Um, then we move to step two, which is initiation, which we're initiating the authentication process. Uh, the first step of initiation is actually optional, and this has security implications that we're going to talk about later. Uh, the supplicant um, is going to, uh, it's going to begin with the supplicant sending an ePOL start frame to the authenticator. The authenticator is going to receive this and respond with an EAP request identity frame um, that just gets sent back to the supplicant. And, you know, at that point, that EAP request identity frame is basically asking, who are you? And the supplicant is going to respond with an EAP response identity frame, which contains the username um, or an identifier such as the username. Um, the authenticator is going to encaps encapsulate that EAP response identity in a radius access request frame because it can actually it can't actually validate the stuff itself, and it's going to forward it off to the authentication server. And then we're going to move from step two to step three, which is EAP negotiation. So. Um, 802.1x actually implements uh, authentication using EAP. And EAP, you can think of it as, as like an API or black box for perform performing um, authentication. Uh, there's many ways to implement it, but the important part is that there's going to be a set of inputs, you know, kind of like a generic um, set of acceptable inputs that you can put into it, and you're going to get a consistent output from it, which is either an EAP success or EAP failure, or authentic authentication success or authentication failure. Um, so in step three, what's going to happen is that the authentication server and the supplicant are going to haggle for a bit until they decide on the EAP method they're both comfortable with. When they do, we move to step four, which is authentication. Um, so this is where we actually perform the EAP authentication. The specific details, as we mentioned, of how this should work are dependent on the EAP method. Uh, EAP method is just a fancy way of saying, you know, however you're choosing to implement EAP. Um, but it's dependent on the EAP method chosen between the authentication server and the supplicant. So this will always result in an EAP success or EAP failure message. That's the important part to remember about this. And if we get an EAP success, uh, the port's going to be set to an authorized state and communications can be allowed through that port. Otherwise, it's going to either remain un unauthorized or in a lot of cases, they're actually just going to shut down the port in in entirely and go alert someone, which is bad if you're an attacker, that is. So we've been talking a lot about EAP. Um, 
EAP is uh, short for Extensible Authentication Protocol. Um, really, like calling it a protocol is like not or authentication protocol is kind of misleading. It's more of an authentication framework because it, it's it's only defining message formats. The actual implementation is wrapped up in, in what's called an EAP method. And as we mentioned, you know, earlier, it's it's pretty much more like a black box for performing authentication. Um, just going to briefly mention some notable EAP methods. Uh, we're going to talk about them in more detail later, but I should probably hit play on that. Um, the first of which is EAP MD5. Um, spoiler alert, it's kind of bad. There are a lot of security issues with it. EAP peep, another EAP method. It also sucks. Um, I know it's soap, but it looks delicious, so I just wanted to include it in this presentation. <laughs> There's also EAP TLS, and the traditional school of thought has been that EAP TLS is a lot better than the other two I just mentioned, but um, more on that later, too. Um, with that out of the way, let's do a brief history of wired port security, uh, also just to kind of get ourselves up to speed with what we're going to talk about today. Um, in 2001, uh, the, you know, IEEE released um, 802.1x 2001, and that, this standard was created to provide a rudimentary authentication mechanism um, for local area networks. The, pro the standard was revised in 2004 with 802.1x 2004, um, you know, and this extension basically was designed to facilitate the use of 802.1x in wireless environments. A year after that happened, a researcher named Steve Riley uh, figured out that you could actually bypass 802.1x 2004 and 2001 as well by inserting a hub between the supplicant and the authenticator. And basically doing this lets you just passively sniff traffic uh, be between the two, those, those two entities, right? Um, you could also interact with the network to a limited degree by injecting UDP traffics. Um, injecting TCP packets would, would cause a race condition, so that wasn't really feasible. But this was like the first, you know, kind of documented uh, mention of, of, of such a bypass. Fast forward six years to 2011, Abbott Gremmel Security created a tool called Marvin. Marvin uh, was able to bypass 802.1x by introducing the rogue device directly between the supplicant and the switch. So before we were using a hub, which by 2011, those were starting to become harder and harder to find. Um, but Abstool was actually able to, it had two network interfaces. You know, you have this rogue device that's inserted between the, the switch and, and like this authorized workstation. And this rogue device has two network interfaces. One of them is connected to the uh, to, the, to, the, to the workstation, one of them is connected to the switch, and it actually is able to use a, a, a Linux bridge, just kind of forward these packets transparently back and forth, and bypass uh, port security uh, without using a hub. And also, it, you're able to get full packet and in, uh, full interaction with the network using packet injection. Um, later that year, and, and this is actually probably the, the most widely used 802.1x2004 bypass out there, um, Alva Duckwall introduced um, a, similar, um, a, a similar bypass technique. It was a little simpler, um, which, is, which is a really good thing. Um, so Alpha Duckwall's implementation also uses a transparent bridge to introduce the rogue device between the supplicant and switch, uh, but unlike Ab's technique, it, it doesn't rely on packet inj injection. Um, instead, you interact with the network by creating a source net using IP tables, and this lets you uh, basically push packets onto the network and, and make it look as if it's coming from the, um, the supplicant device, you know, the, the authorized workstation, that you're kind of like middling doing this process. Uh, and, and actually very recently, 2017, we have Valerian Legrand, he created um, a tool called Fenrir, and it works very similarly to Duckwall's tool, but it's all implemented in Python at a very high level, uh, so you don't run into some of the kernel patching issues that uh, uh, Duckwall's tool is, is kind of affected by. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty cool, it has a mo modular design, support for responder, all that good stuff. So um, I guess when I started working on this project, uh, it made sense the first thing to do should be to uh, kind of try to recreate the, the classic, uh, Duckwall's classic 802.1x um, 2004 bypass and also see if there's any ways that it can be improved upon. Um, so looking at Duckwall's 802.1x bypass more closely, uh, we mentioned you use a transparent bridge to silently introduce the rogue device between the subplug and, and authenticator and you achieve network interaction using source NAT. Um, another interesting feature of, of Duckwall's device, remember that, you know, when we're, when we're performing this style of attack, we're, you know, presumably we're not able, this is going to be performed on a network and in, in a physical environment, like a building or something like that, that we do not own and we're not supposed to be getting into in the first place. You know, so it's not like, you know, you're on like a, like a red team or physical security assessment where you can go walk in, you know, set up this device, install like a monitor and just sit there on the computer interacting with this thing. You have to kind of like get in there, hook this thing up and get out. So it's important when you're, when you're doing this kind of thing that whatever, whatever, however you implement these kinds of attacks, you provide yourself with a mechanism of, of reconnecting with this rogue device uh, remotely um, once you perform the bypass and once you've actually uh, made your egress from the building. So the way Duckwell's implementation does this, well, it actually uses two methods. The first is a hidden SSH service that's created using destination natting, and also um, uh, it has support for like an outbound like SSH channel uh, that goes through the, the target network and lets you connect that way. Um, 
So I, I was able to improve on, upon uh, Duckwell's implementation a couple ways. Um, you know, back back when uh, Duckwell's implementation was first created, uh, the Linux kernel was not forwarding equal packets over bridge. It was completely disabled um, and as a security feature. Uh, so and actually, you know, traditionally, if you look at most tools that deal with 802.1x 2004 or bypassing it, should I say, they deal with this problem in the same way that Duckwell had to, which is essentially patching the Linux kernel. Um, the exception to this is is Fender by Valerian Legrand, and he just does this completely at a high level using Scapy, so it doesn't really matter. You don't have to rely on the the, the, the kernel patching. Um, so this made sense at the time, but there are some problems with both of these approaches. And one is that relying on kernel patches can become un unwieldy. Um, at this time, there are no longer any publicly available kernel patches for modern kernel versions that will perform this epoll bridging. And the reason for that, if you think about what it takes to maintain a, a tool of any kind, you know, you constantly have to maintain this kernel patch because if you don't, you know, you can bet that the, the, the kernel development team is going to keep working on, you know, pushing updates to the kernel and kind of if you think of your like here's your patch and here's like the, the direction that the kernel's going and eventually that patch is no longer going to work um, after, you know, subsequent iterations of updates to the kernel. And that's kind of the state we're in now. Um, and then if you deal with uh, high level tools such as Scapy, um, they work really well because you don't have to rely on, on, on kernel patches but also it can slow down your bridge under heavy loads because it just isn't able to handle it in the same way that the, the lower level implementation can. So fortunately the situation has dramatically improved since Duckwell's contribution. In 2012, epoll bridging actually was, was added to the kernel, uh, but kind of as like an optional feature that you had to enable using the pros file system. The pros file system is pretty cool. It's actually like an API to the Linux kernel that you could, that you could let you reconfigure stuff on the fly and you can just interact with it by setting values and files and stuff like that. So basically you just, you change the, the, the value of this file within the pros file system um, and you can forward epoll packets. So we added that in there. And the other improvement that we added was support for side channel interaction. Uh, when Duckwell created his original 802.1x bypass, um, you know, this was 2011. You know, cellular modems were, were, were pretty unsophisticated, they were slow, they were very expensive, you couldn't just go down to Best Buy or, or, or whatever and buy yourself like a $15 LT uh, modem with a prepaid plan that you could plug into your rogue device. So this is why he kind of had to rely on the hidden SSH service and the, and the outbound SSH channels. Um, this is not a perfect solution though because it relies on the assumption that egress filtering can be bypassed. So if you can improve upon it, that would be great. Also it relies on pushing traffic through the target network, creating an opportunity for detection. Um, so, you know, kind of now that we have the opportunity, you know, it's, it's, it's several years later at this point, so, you know, we have the opportunity to leverage a lot of this newer um, cellular technology um, to kind of establish a side channel to, to, our, to our lead behind device. That also lets us deal with, you know, air gap networks and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, the updated implementation, uh, it actually relies on a side channel interface to provide the attacker with connectivity rather than the hidden SSH service or the outbound SSH channel. Um, we had to mo modify some firewall rules to get this to work, but it's totally worth it because now you can just connect over LTE. So, here's the demo of, of uh, our improved implementation here. To figure out how to get this to play. Oh, cool. Okay. Can I fast forward? Interesting. All right, well. All right, the video's running. I just don't know how to, oh, jeez. Okay, all right, that seems to be working, so I'm not gonna touch it. <laughs> okay, so, um, no, it's paused. Okay, so what's happening here, right, in the, t in the left hand side we have the attacker's device um, on the top right here, if you can see my mouse, can you guys see my mouse? Okay, well pretend there's a mouse pointing at the top right of the screen. That's the, that's the supplicant. Let's play pretend. Um, in, the, in, the, in the bottom right, that's the switch we're connecting to. Uh, you notice that we've disconnected the device here and we're running this software on the left, which is setting up the transparent bridge we were talking about. And up, oh, it's turning yellow in the bottom right, uh, so that means it's Reauthenticating, and we're just kind of forwarding that authentication. And oh, magically, the supplicant that's in the top right is able to communicate with. It's going to go back to ping 8.8.8.8, .8 which apparently this is just what this workstation is used for. Um, yeah. So now we're going to add network interaction by running this other command. Um, basically, I, I, you can see all these other flags and other information that we're passing to it. When we set up the, the initial transparent bypass, we were able, you know, pushing a position where you can sniff all of that, which is pretty neat. Um, Still running. Well, long story short, you can you can scan things with Nmap, but um, just 
I'll, I'll post the videos on, on, on the accompanying blog post after this, so you can go check them out there. Anyways, so all traditional 802.1x bypasses either HUD based injection or bridge based take advantage of the same fundamental security issues that affect 802.1x 2004. Uh, the protocol does not provide encryption and the, the protocol does not support authentication on a packet by packet basis and that's why this bridge based bypass works. Um, so to kind of mitigate this problem, uh, you know, a, another revision to the protocol is introduced called 802.1x 2010. And 802.1x 2010 uh, uses MACSEC, which provides layer 2 encryption performed on a hop by hop basis and packet by packet in, in integrity checks. So this kind of throws a wrench in the whole bridge based attack scenario that we just talked about. Um, interestingly enough, it also allows network administrators as, with a means to inspect data in transit. So because the encryption is only performed, you know, on a hop by hop basis, you can still inspect traffic, uh, which is actually a pretty big deal. So 802.1x 2010 works in three stages. Uh, the, the first stage is authentication and master key distribution. The sec second stage is session key agreement. And the third stage, stage is the session secure stage. So stage one, we mentioned authentication. I mean, that's pretty much the, the 802.1x authentication process that we talked about before. Um, you're going to perform those four steps that we talked about, and then you're going to perform EAP authentication um, using some EAP method that is going to be selected between the supplicant and the authentication server. And if that succeeds, we'll move to stage two, which is the session, session key agreement. Uh, the, the basically, the, the, what's happening in the session key agreement is that the, um, the authenticator is going to establish that the supplicant is actually capable of supporting MACSEC. And if it is, uh, you're going to install the SAC on the supplicant, and we're going to move to step three. And step three is session secure. So in session secure, um, basically at this point, everything is encrypted um, at layer two. Uh, your, your max sec is fully enabled, and this is kind of where we are trying to get to. So, I guess like, uh, with this in mind, right, you know, whenever you're trying to come up with like a way of bypassing or attacking some kind of new technology, I think it's useful to, uh, to kind of look at parallels, you know, between whatever you're currently working with and similar technologies that have been compromised in the past or even recently. And with that in mind, this particular section, section 6.6 .6 in the 802.1x uh, 2010 standard kind of stuck out at me. And basically it's, it's comparing, it, it's basically stating that conceptually the cryptographic capabilities provided by 802.1x 2010 kind of play the same role as similar, you know, cryptographic capabilities provided for wireless networks in 802.11, right? So I think what they're alluding to here are parallels between MaxSec and WPA. And actually, if you look at, you know, why inter, uh, WPA1 was released back in 2003, um, well, when it was released, what it was introducing was layer two encryption between the access point to the station. And this, you know, authentication that provided access to this encryption was provided by EAP or using pre-shared key as a fallback or alternative. Um, when WPA was released, there was a major paradigm shift that had to happen, you know, from an attacker's perspective, because, you know, prior to WPA, injection-based attacks were all the rage. You know, you could use them, they were very effective against web, they were very um, effective against open networks, um, but now because of WPA, they were no longer possible due to that layer two encryption. So what you saw was a major shift in focus from attacking um, the encryption itself to actually attacking the authentication mechanism and not even dealing with the encryption. So that's where you start to see the WPA handshake captures and dictionary attacks against PSK networks, and that's when you start to see uh, rogue AP attacks against weak EAP methods on wireless networks emerge as well. So if you fast forward to 2010, right, 802.1x 2010 has been released, and, you know, very similarly, we're providing hop by hop layer 2 encryption using MACSEC. And, you know, this is being, this, this encryption is either occurring between the device and the switch or from multiple, two switches to kind of encrypt the traffic between the two of them. Once again, authentication is being provided by EAP or PSK as a fallback. Kind of see where I'm going with this. So, I mean, the, the obvious hypothesis here is that it makes sense to start with a hypothesis that you could also perform a similar shift of focus and start looking at attacking the authentication mechanism rather than trying to attack MACSIC itself because why do things that are hard? Um, with PSK, um, I would venture to speculate that some kind of dictionary attack may be possible, although I haven't really worked on that, so I don't know. Um, but in this talk, we're talking about attacks against weak EAP implementations. So, another spoiler alert there. To kind of more understand this, 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 these kind of parallels, uh, let's talk you know, very briefly about attacks against WPA2 EAP, right? And um, so the most commonly, like, widely known um, weak EAP method is uh, EAP peep, and it's very similar to EAP TTLS, um, so you can kind of talk about them, you know, in the same way. 
Uh, the way e EAP peep works is that the supplicant, and remember we're talking a wireless context now, the supplicant is going to make an authentication request to the authentication server, which is going to respond with an X509 certificate. At this point, um, basically the role of this certificate is, is for the authentication server to prove to the supplicant uh, that it is who it says it is, that it can be trusted. The supplicant is either going to accept or deny, it's either going to accept or reject that certificate. If it accepts that certificate, it means that trust has been established between the supplicant and authentication server, which moves us from the outer authentication process to the inner authentication process of EAP peep. And, you know, the inner authentication process happens when the, the secure tunnel is established between the supplicant and the authentication server and basically transmit your, your identity, your username, um, uh, password in, in the form of hashes, uh, what have you, through the secure tunnel. And the secure tunnel is there to prevent you from sniffing this process passively. So this process does have security issues. Remember, we're operating wirelessly. Two research, researchers named Brad Antonowitz and Josh Wright, uh, back in 2008, they were able to discover that you could use a, a rogue um, access point attack to force a supplicant to authenticate with a rogue authentication server. Um, what do we mean by rogue access point attack? Well, basically, um, you have all these, these, these wireless devices here and you force them to connect to your own access point, establishing a man in the middle. Uh, there are many ways to implement this, uh, but that is the general concept that remains the same. You know, so pretty much you force them to connect to you and then you force it to authenticate with your rogue authentication server. And to do this you have to send the, um, you do have to send the target device, you know, one of these X509 certificates, and it, it's probably gonna have to be self-signed or, or at least generated by, by rogue CA, but you know, in a lot of cases the supplicant will either just automatically accept it or it's going to be left up to the user to accept the, the certificate, in which case, you know, you'll always find someone within an organization who's going to accept that thing, so it's kind of okay. Um, making this worse, right? Uh, when we talked about inner authentication um, it's, as being the, the part that's happening through that secure tunnel. Well, the strongest form of EAP um, authentication available for EPP and EPTTLS is ms 2 uh, at least, you know, the, the one that's, ones that are widely used. So. MS Chappie 2 is interesting because although it, it provides mutual authentication, um, it actually is vulnerable to a cryptographic weakness that was discovered by Moxie Mar Marlin Spike and David Holton back in 2012. Um, essentially, once you capture the um, MS Chappie 2 challenge and response that is sent through the secure tunnel, um, using the rogue AP attack that we just described, uh, you can reduce it to, 50, to 56 bits of DES encryption um, using a divide and conquer attack, which, you know, at that point, uh, uh, Marlon Spike and Holton were able to uh, demonstrate that with, with a 100% success rate, regardless of the length of the, of the password, they were able to convert it into an NT password hash, which is password equivalent, within 24 hours with a 100% success rate. Now remember, this is back in 2012. Although they were using a $100,000 cracking rig to do this, if you look at what their cracking rig would cost now, it's somewhere between like 10 and $20,000, which is roughly within the, you know, it's actually pretty much within the range of most kind of like mid-level, I guess like the startups of the criminal world, if, if you will. Um, let alone in like a nation state or like an APT. So let's go back to Ida Tito next 2010. Um, with all this in mind, the most important takeaway about Ida Tito next 2010 from an attacker's perspective is that it still uses EAP to authenticate devices to the network. And EAP, as we just talked about, is only as secure as the EAP method used. So, you know, the 802.1x 2010 standard allows any EAP method so long as it supports mutual authentication, supports derivation of keys that are at least 128 bits in length, and generates an MSK of at least 64 octets. And there are plenty of commonly seen weak EAP methods that meet these requirements, including EAP PEEP, EAP TTLS, et cetera. I think you see where we're going with this. So this is where we kind of go into the, our, our, our new contribution where, um, going to introduce something called a rogue gateway attack that can be used to defeat 802.1x 2010. This slide is kind of misleading because it's saying defeating MaxSec with um, using rogue gateway attacks. It really we're just avoiding having to deal with MaxSec um, by kind of cutting it off at the authentication process. So the goal of a rogue gateway attack is to force the supplicant to auth authenticate with the attacker's device. Remember on the, we're on the wired network, we're on a wired network, not a wireless network, so we're going to have to get creative in terms of figuring out how, you know, a way that we, that we can do this. Um, once, once you get this device to authenticate with you, um, you're able to capture hashes which you crack and then you get credentials and just you can authenticate directly with the network at that point. Uh, so when we talked about bypassing it to 2004, we use a man in the middle style bypass. Uh, so here you see we have this rogue device that's directly uh, between the authenticator and the um, authorized workstation, which is the supplicant. Um, we're gonna have to do something a bit different with the 802.1x 2010. We're gonna have to go for direct access because this isn't going to work uh, due to that layer two encryption. So let's talk about how we can build a device that can do this. Um, the first step of actually setting up our bypass is actually just to set up our device. We see this, this, this is our road device here, kind of our, our design for it. Um, 
we have our, our three, three network interfaces, the side channel interface, and that's gonna provide us at remote access to this device, uh, you know, via LTE or, or, or what have you, right? Um, we're also gonna have an upstream interface that's gonna be connected, or eventually be connected, should I say, uh, to the switch port. Um, and we have our, our fee interface here, which is gonna be, con or PHO, I don't actually know how to say that. I just see it in documents all the time. Phi, okay, cool, cool. Learn a new thing every day. So we have our Phi interface. <laughs> and that's connected to the supplicant. Um, and the device itself, you just use a mini computer. We use an Intel Nuke, or Nook, Nuke, Nook. <laughs> running, <laughs> running Fedora 28. Um, so what we're gonna need is a way of diverting traffic to the rogue device. Um, so I'm gonna take a look at this picture, right? This is, this is a set of train tracks. And in, in the end of the train tracks here, we have this little train station here, and then we have a switch here, and if, depending on which way the switch is, is configured, if the switch is configured in mode A, the train is gonna go directly into the train station. If the switch is configured in mode B, or mode, I just spoiled it, in mode B, uh, <laughs> the train is just gonna bypass the, the station entirely. It'd be cool if we could do something like that with Ethernet, right? So you actually can, you can buy these little devices off of Amazon um, for like 10 bucks, and it's a mechanical A-B splitter. Uh, you, you press the, the A button, and your Ethernet traffic's diverted mechanically through rogue A, or through port A, press the B button, and it's um, diverted mechanically through port B. Um, this would be cool, but you know, if that, since it's a leave, uh, a leave behind device, if we're gonna actually use this, we need a way of ma manipulating that push switch. Um, there are a couple, a couple ways you could do this. Uh, theoretically, you could use a relay um, to do this, which essentially you either, you know, use high or low current to kind of like affect where the, uh, you know, where the, where the Ethernet traffic's gonna go. Uh, unless you're an electrical engineer, and that's definitely not me, building something like this is going to lead to impedance issues, um, which is why a better option is to use solenoids. A solenoid is basically a, a linear motor. Uh, you have a, a rod going through, you know, that's with a coil wrapped around it, and you run electricity through the coil, and you know, depending if it's a, configured as a push pull or uh, push solenoid or pull, pull solenoid, it's either gonna result in that rod being you know, kind of like slammed outward or pulled back in. So you can use that to create a pushing motion, which you can use to manipulate those, those buttons we saw there. So our completed, um, our completed rogue device design is gonna look like that. We have a rogue device as, as set up as, as we saw before. Uh, we're also gonna have these physical AB splitters um, a, um, on either side, our upstream splitter and our, and our downstream splitter. And we're gonna have this, this uh, wired link uh, between the two of them. And we'll also, whoops, we'll also have a, a passive tap uh, that is going between these two splitters when it's, when it's in bypass mode that will let us to, allow us to um, inspect traffic. If you ever used uh, Michael Osman's uh, throwing star land tap, you build something that's basically similar to that and use it to, to inspect traffic when you're in bypass mode. Um, so when the switches are, are, are in mode A, um, traffic is completely bypassing the rogue device and going directly between the authenticator and the supplicant. Uh, when you use the solenoids to flip the, the, the switches into mode B, uh, now traffic is diverted to the rogue device. So to actually implement the attack, uh, we, we flip the switches, you know, after we planted the device, we remotely uh, flip the switches to mode B, and we shut down the upstream interface, which essentially blocks any traffic from, from being sent to or from the authenticator. And then we set up our rogue authentication server uh, to listen on our Phi interface. And essentially what this does is it forces the supplicant to authenticate with us. And you'll have to inject an equal start frame um, to yourself to get this to work, and we'll talk about what that is later. Um, but this actually will actually force the device to authenticate with you. And then once you are able to capture those, those, uh, those hashes provided they're using a weak AAP, AAP method, um, you can crack them, and then you bring down your Phi interface, bring up your upstream interface, and authenticate directly with the network. And you just kind of very lazily avoided having to deal with 802.1x entirely. So here's our, um, our, our updated demo. There's gonna be some lag, because I, I, I don't really know how to f fast forward through it. But okay, so in the, in the bottom right, yeah, so those are the solenoids actually flipping the AB switch. Um, I made them really big so you could see them, although obviously you'd want to use a smaller implementation. Um, actually, the first time I got this to work, I freaked the hell out of my wife, because she's like, what is that? Did you electrocute yourself? And, um, <laughs> which I was actually pretty concerned about myself, because I don't really do this very often. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, Essentially we set it up, is this paused? Yes it is. Okay, so yeah, we diverted to, uh, the traffic to us. It's playing again. I don't know how to control this device, I'm sorry. <laughs> but what you will see, see soon is that 
basically, yeah, so we've, we've cut off connectivity from there and we have our hashes that we've captured. And from there we go ahead and crack them. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I honestly don't know why you're clapping. That is like the laziest attack that like, what, <laughs> whatever, they, they wanted me to come talk about it, so. <laughs> So let's take a quick detour really fast. Now that we've gone over that, um, kind of some other stuff that I looked into while working on this project was um, kind of the current state of Mac filtering and, and Mac authentication bypass because it's something that's been affecting me directly a lot lately. Um, so fun fact, not all devices support 802.1x. Who'd have thought, right? Um, <laughs> but not all devices support 802.1x. Uh, but enterprise organizations, uh, you know, that, that need to use these devices, they still need to be able to deploy them anyways, you know, so, so when this happens, you know, when you're an enterprise organization that uses 802.1x but you have to de deploy a device that doesn't support it, um, traditionally what you've, you've had to do is create what's known as a port security exception. And when, a port security exception, essentially you just disable 802.1x on the port used by that device. Um, when you do this, you usually replace, replace 802.1x with Mac filtering or some other f weak form of access control, not always, but usually. Um, and historically, these have been pretty prevalent because of the widespread lack of 802.1x support by peripheral devices such as printers, IP cameras, all those essentials that, you know, just don't have the, the, the sophistication of, of like a, a full workstation or something like that. So port security exception, exceptions have traditionally been very low hanging fruit for attackers. It's much easier to try to find a port security exception than to try to actually bypass 802.1x 2000, uh, 2000 whatever, um, using a bridge or a hub. Um, the problem is, and I, I kind of had to go try to verify this myself just by looking into things because I, anybody do like, like uh, any, any red teamers here or physic, people who have done like physical security assessments? Yeah, haven't you gotten the impression that these are just becoming much and less, less prevalent? Like, it, it's just slowly kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it a, a bit, it actually makes sense. Um, if you, you know, basically support for 802.1x peripheral, uh, support by, uh, for 802.1x by peripheral device manufacturers, um, it actually has increased dramatically in recent years. Um, if you, I mean, a, a good example of this, if you, if you go on Newegg or whatever and just look up multi-function printers and, and try to find ones that support 802.1x, pretty much every major manufacturer of, of a multi-function printer, um, has at least one model that's affordable by an enterprise, um, an enterprise budget, um, and by that I don't mean like a $5,000 printer, I mean like, you know, Couple, couple hundred dollars um, that supports 802.1x. Uh, so, you know, the result of this is that, you know, as legacy hardware is phased out, either breaks or just gets cycled out, um, you know, on a however, you know, whatever basis, um, it's gonna, you know, it gets replaced with 802.1x capable models. So, what this means is that port security exceptions are becoming much and le much less prevalent than they used to be. And, you know, al although they're, they're still there, they're not quite the low hanging fruit that they, that they, that they once were. Um, which, which seems, seems like a good thing, except for the fact that, you know, we have to remember improved adoption of 802.1x does not necessarily imply strong uh, port security for peripheral devices for the following reasons. Uh, to begin with, you know, 802.1x 2010 support is really only just starting to become a reality for really, really expensive enterprise networking hardware, let alone peripheral devices. Um, you know, additionally, w you know, we mentioned that 802.1x 2004 can be bypassed using bridges, injections, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we're releasing a tool that makes it really easy to do that as well, so that's gonna become a little easier to do. Um, with that said, you know, adoption for secure EAP methods can be expected to be lower on these peripheral devices than on domain joined devices. So it, it kind of, you know, begs the question, you know, can we use, can we just attack EAP as a means of, of, of kind of compensating for the diminishing returns that we're getting from port security exceptions? And, and doing this actually makes sense when you consider that the adoption of secure EAP methods is already low across the board, let alone um, uh, peripheral devices which often can't be configured uh, from a you know, centrally in the same way that a domain joined workstation can be. So I guess your first option for doing this, if, they're using, if the if peripheral device is using something like EAP peep or EAP TTLS, you could use a similar row gateway attack like what we talked about before. Uh, you don't actually need the mechanical splitters to do this this time though, you just set up your transparent bridge like, like we talked about and you know, then just disable your upstream interface, disable your bridge, and you know, launch, um, launch your rogue authentication server on your fire interface, right? And then from there you're able to, you know, capture hashes, crack them, and authenticate directly with the network. Interestingly enough though, um, honestly like one of the most widely used EAP methods that you see using um, peripheral devices, uh, s such as multifunction printers, is EAPMD5. 
which is really, really old and kind of crappy, but you know, when you, when you think about it, it's also really, really, really easy to set up and configure and it's still better than Mac filtering, right? So, you know, you, you, you can honestly, if you're deploying EAPMD5 and protecting all your printers with it, you can say, yes, all of our devices support 802.1x. We're not going to tell you how we implemented that, but they support 802.1x. Um, so the way EAPMD5 works, uh, it, you know, once again, it's a, it's a really old, it's a really old EAP implementation. Uh, it, the, the first step of the EAPMD5 authentication process is that the authentication server is going to send an EAP request identity frame to, uh, to the supplicant. And the supplicant is going to respond with an EAP response identity frame, uh, which is, it, it's providing a username. The authentication server is then going to create a randomly generated string of characters. Awesome. We're good. Um, it's going to create a randomly uh, generated string of characters in the form of an EAP challenge, and it's going to send that off to the supplicant as an EAP challenge request. Um, the supplicant's then going to take that randomly generated string of characters, concatenate it with its username, concatenate that with its password, and then dump that through the MD5 hash function. And what comes out of that MD5 hash function is the EAP challenge response, which is sent back to the EAP authentication server. The authentication server is then going to do the exact same hashing um, operation that the supplicant did, generate its own response, and then compare it to the one that it received from the supplicant. If they match, then authentication succeeds. If they fail, then authentication, or if they don't match, authentication fails. So, um, kind of the, the, the thing to remember about this authentication process is the entire process is, is occurring over plain text, which, which, um, you know, if, if you think about it, you know, we, we don't have the benefit of that tunnel that we had with EPP or EPTTLS. Um, and, and what that means is that an attacker can uh, basically sniff this process passively, uh, capture the username, capture the EMP challenge, EAPMD5 challenge request, and the EAPMD5 challenge response, and then basically perform a dictionary attack to obtain the password. Um, and actually, a couple of researchers from China in 2012, they were able to uh, recover uh, EAPMD5 credentials even faster using a length recovery attack. So, I mean, this is essentially a really, really broken protocol. So, with this in mind, and leveraging what we know not only about how to attack EAPMD5, uh, but how to, talk, uh, how to attack 802.1x 2004 as well, um, it, you know, it follows that we can use, we can start out by using a bridge-based approach, a bridge-based bypass to place a rogue device between the supplicant and the authenticator. We then, we then start sniffing traffic um, being tr sent back and forth between these devices. You know, we, we, we then wait for the supplicant to authenticate, sniff the EAPMD5 challenge, sniff the EAPMD5 response when it does, uh, crack the credentials, and just then authenticate directly with the network. Uh, there is one major drawback to this approach, and that's that we have to wait for the supplicant to re-authenticate with the switch, uh, which actually that's not going to happen unless we disable a virtual network interface, or I'm sorry, um, disabling a virtual network interface isn't enough to make that happen, and it's real, realistically not going to happen unless we actually unplug the, the, the supplicant from, 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 the, from the switch itself. Uh, we could use the mechanical splitters that we talked about with 802.1x 2010, uh, but honestly the less overhead the better, and right now we're going for simpler. Um, so, uh, basically, um, another thing that, the, the, the third contribution that we have here is the EAP um, MD5 forced re-authentication attack against 802.1x 2004. Um, we mentioned that the first two steps of the initialization process, right, uh, which re realistically are the first two steps of the EAP authentication process, that's pretty much the whole thing combined, um, are that the supplicant's going to send the authenticator an equal start frame, and that's going to signal to the authenticator that it should send the supplicant an EAP request identity frame, because we're beginning the authentication process. We also mentioned that this first step, the ePoll start frame, is optional. The reason why the first step is optional is that the authenticator needs a, a means of, of forcing the supplicant to re-authenticate, you know, in the event of a problem, in the event that they need to reconfigure something, et cetera. So that's left as an optional, as an optional step. The problem with this is that the supplicant has no way of verifying if the incoming EAP request identity frame has been sent in response to an ePoll start. Um, you know, essentially like, we can force re-authentication by sending an equal start frame to the authenticator as if it came from the supplicant using max, max spoofing. And this, the result will be that the authenticator's going to send an EAP request on any frame to the actual supplicant and kickstart the re-authentication process. Um, when this happens, both the authenticator and the supplicant are going to believe that the other party has initiated the re-authentication attempt. And as you can see here in this, this little video here, we can just inject, repeatedly inject equal start frames using Scapy in the bottom left, and that forces re-authentication. And it, it's very, very easy to do and very fast. So, if we take this information and add it to, 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 our, to our first attack, our passive attack against EAPMD5, we come out with, um, you know, 
I guess what we call the EPMD5 force free authentication attack, in which we start out by introducing this rogue device to the to the network uh, directly between the authenticator and the supplicant, set up our bridge as before, start passively sniffing traffic. We then force free authentication by sending a spoofed EPL start frame to the authenticator, and then from there that allows us to immediately capture um, the EPMD5 challenge response and the EPMD5 challenge, crack those, and then we can authenticate with the network that way. And this is pretty fast if you just run this. Yeah, it's, we've literally just by running the thing, now we have the request ID, the challenge, the response, and also the identity. And that's it. Um, I guess like the first proposal to get mitigation to this, uh, that comes to mind, although, the, you know, honestly this is probably not bulletproof either, um, is to put a safety bit in the EP request identity frame. You can set it to one if the frame was sent in response to the equal start frame, uh, and check it when the supplicant receives an EAP request at any frame. And, you know, essentially, if, if the safety bit's set to one and the supplicant did not recently issue an EAPL start frame, uh, you abort the authentication process. So just to wrap this up, um, just to summarize our contributions, uh, what we kind of went over today, uh, we've introduced the rogue gateway, um, and, and bait and switch, which, which in conjunction with one another can be used to bypass 802.1x2010 by attacking its authentication mechanism. Um, we've also introduced an updated and improved, we, we've also updated and improved existing 802.1x 2004 bypass techniques, uh, emphasi emphasizing on the, uh, on the, uh, techniques introduced by, by, uh, Alva Duckwall, um, back in 2011. And we've also introduced the EAP MD5 forestry authentication attack, which is an improved attack against M EAP MD5 on wired networks. Uh, some key takeaways, uh, before we wrap this up. Uh, port security is still a very, very positive thing. Please keep using it. Um, but it's not a substitute for a layered approach to network security. It, you know, deploying, uh, deploying port security does not absolve you from, from, from very basic responsibilities like patch management, um, you know, kind of keeping tabs of, yeah, it does, it, it's, it, it's part of, a, it needs to be part of a larger system that is designed to keep your network secure. And additionally, the benefits provided by 802.1x uh, can be undermined due to the continued use of EAP as an authentication mechanism. Um, and finally, improved 802.1x support by peripheral devices, um, or should I say peripheral device manufacturers, is largely undermined by lack of support for 802.1x 2010 and low adoption and support rates for strong EAP methods. Uh, if you want to look over this information in more detail, uh, there's going to be a blog post. I tried putting in the entire URL of the blog post, but like it just kind of took up the entire slide. So it's just the first results on uh, digitalsilence.com slash blog. Um, and finally, uh, we have the, uh, if you actually want to try it, try performing these, uh, the tool and the associated documentation is available on github.com slash solstice slash silent bridge. Thank you very much.